Hello everyone. Today, the eminent personality we have with us needs no introduction as his pioneering work in the field of medicine has not only contributed a lot to the Indian healthcare but is recognized all over the world. Dr. Amrish Mittal, the renowned endocrinologist, was awarded the Padma Bhushan in the year 2015. Dr. Mittal was the first DM in endocrinology from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in the year 1987. He was awarded the NIH for Gatti Fellowship. Dr. Mittal established India's first bone density measurement system and osteoporosis service in SGPGIMS Lucknow in 1997 and has received widespread recognition for his work related to vitamin D and bone health over the last two decades. Dr. Amrish is the first and only Indian to receive the Boy Frame Award of the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research in 2004. He received the Springer Citation Prize in 2013 for his paper on global vitamin D status. In the first part of the interview we discussed about the osteoporosis management and in this part of the interview we'll be discussing about the thyroid disorders so to begin with so what is the epidemiology of the thyroid disorders do you think in the last decade or over the last decade well ashita i'll go back further you know it's not just in the last decade because uh, i'm an old man and i've seen it change from the 80s to now so when we were students when we were uh, you know residents of en in endocrinology at the all india institute in the 80s the endocrine opd bulk was adenine deficiency disorders goiters big goit women coming with goiters men coming with goiters from different parts of india coming for treatment for salvation you know whatever now so so the if you ask this question when i was appearing for my dm exam my answer would be adenine deficiency adenine deficiency adenine deficiency right but due to impressive policies by by successive governments of addition of salt and others the idea is the 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 iodine deficiency disorders like goiter and cretinism have dramatically reduced so i hardly ever see that kind of of goiter and iodine deficiency that i used to see 30 years ago it's gone Okay, so the epidemiology of thyroid disorders has changed completely. So while, as I said, it was iron deficiency, now the bulk of thyroid disorders that we see are autoimmune, right? Which means the epidemiology is becoming a little bit much more like the Western epidemiology that we used to read at that time. Which means that even now thyroid disorders are quite common. various studies have have shown different percentages but if you look at a population study and if you look at sub clinical hypothyroidism you have studies that give figures from 10 to 19% of sub clinical hypothyroidism which is very high the, the sub clinical hypothyroidism may or may not be a disease per se we'll talk about that later but if you include that and if you don't include that only overt hypothyroidism which is by far the commonest of the thyroid condition you still get figures of 1% 2% in different studies one study even up to 3% so so it which is not a small number right so uh, epidemiology of thyroid disorders has changed from being iodine deficiency disorders to autoimmune thyroid disease and a large high prevalence of subclinical hypothyroidism at least in the urban parts of india since the epidemiology changed how would, do you think the role of endocrinologist has changed over the decade and two then yes i mean endocrinology when when i joined endocrinology very few people knew about endocrinology and endocrinology you know en encompasses diabetes which is enough to keep you busy for several for several generations you know diabetes you know how big it is but thyroid disorders are so common also it's not just diabetes so endocrinology practice changed because at that point we were only looking at 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 adenine deficiency how to eradicate public health measures now we are looking at treating people with autoimmune thyroid conditions so yes uh, it did change and endocrinologists had to change the way they looked at 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 these conditions so one of the things that happened was that 
thyroid function tests became available you know all around you well not all of them are accurate but fairly reasonable accurate thyroid function test in the last few years are available for most clinicians across the country just as an aside uh, you know the, the 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 report for thyroid function test in the 1980s at aims used to take about a month okay now people complain if it if it's not there in a few hours if they, if they have to come back the next day they 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 make a noise okay that's how technology was at that point that's how technology is now that's how demand is now so so uh, you know uh, yes you need to be careful because people are coming with thyroid reports all the time and these reports could show minor thyroid abnormalities so one of the things that endocrinologists have learned and are experts in is to distinguish those that require treatment from those that don't the most common mistake in thyroid management is that everyone with a borderline thyroid function test is given treatment and i think a specialist differs sometimes from his sort of more uh, general colleagues in that sense that that an endocrinologist should ideally be treating only those that require treatment and i'll give you an example and i think that that this may cover more than what your question is but let it be i think it's so I, I, when we have tsh values of between 5 and 10 tsh thyroid stimulating hormone that is typically subclinical hypothyroidism because at this level the t4 levels are usually normal so you have people with tsh levels of 5 6 7 8 even 9 and a normal t4 so tsh 5 between 5 to 10 normal t4 this is subclinical hypothyroidism most subclinical hypothyroidism patients or individuals don't require treatment and that is very important let's not jump to treat every tsh of 5 6 7 so who are the ones who we should treat actually young women who are planning pregnancy or are pregnant absolutely must be treated even at borderline tsh levels right other than that sometimes patients who have symptoms that won't go away or those who have positive thyroid antibodies which suggest to us that they are going to go down the path of hypothyroidism you know almost well, more likely to go down that path rather than those who have negative antibodies so these are people you know who must be treated what about people sometimes people think that uh, doctors feel psychiatrists feel that those who have borderline tsh but have depression or or psychiatric problems they should also be treated now other than these groups and again i would in particular emphasize planning pregnancy or pregnancy as the most important group here other than these groups you can always wait and watch take a call whether you really will make a difference to that patient's symptoms in any way by treating uh, subclinical hypothyroidism so in one line the message is treat subclinical hypothyroidism only in specific situations don't jump to treat all tsh values between 5 and 10 many of them are harmless will continue at the same level or may even revert sometimes to normal and you just need to keep these patients under follow up with a six monthly or or annual thyroid function test so we would like to know besides thyroid function test what are the clinical presentations are there that may be indicative of thyroid disorders and that physicians should be aware about yeah i mean you know uh, you know very well uh, from your textbooks that you you have hypothyroidism which is much commoner and then you have hyperthyroidism right so hypothyroidism patients may present with really vague symptoms some dullness lethargy low feeling you know even depression sometimes they may present with skin changes they may present with dry skin hair loss dry hair some weight gain you know or they may present for example with growth problems in children with menstrual problems in women 
so all that are, uh, is a full spectrum of thyroid symptoms that you can get but if you are hyperthyroid if you are hyperthyroid then you would tend to get a different spectrum of symptoms obviously which is the reverse people who are anxious losing weight uh, restless sweaty uh, complaining of palpitation you know trembling trembling like a leaf, like a leaf sometimes they used to say people who are severely uh, hyperthyroid so i think the 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 spectrum of symptoms is pretty vast and it requires a very in, in, very high index of suspicion especially for hypothyroidism one should not sort of you know hesitate in asking for a test so ask for test frequently but treat carefully only when indicated in hyperthyroidism you will you will do you will ask for tests only when there are specific symptoms and really you would uh, they require treatment and they typically require treatment with an expert rather than a generalist hyperthyroid hypothyroidism of course everyone should be willing and happy to treat cases of hypothyroidism and as i said to distinguish between subclinical that requires treatment versus that that does not please uh, take the help of colleagues or just hone your own skills and that's a very very important part uh, of, of this uh, treatment so can we assess uh, the severity of hypothyroidism on the basis of tsh report alone and can we predict the dose of initial dose of eltroxin on the basis of this th tsh level without doing t3 and t4 levels yeah i mean i would say that if i find an abnormal tsh i would certainly do a t4 also i would hesitate to treat somebody only on the basis of a tsh because you get caught in in odd situations sometimes so it's good to do a t4 but however people have down the years attempted to classify severity of hypothyroidism based on tsh alone like you know you 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 say 5 to 10 is subclinical 10 to 20 and then 20 above 20 is severe so people have used many classifications i don't think those classifications are really great and it's also very hard to really say that that's the dose you're going to use based on the tsh level in general there are some some rules some rule of the thumb you know which help clinicians decide typically you'd say between 5 and 10 which is subclinical hypothyroidism you would use a dose between 25 and 50 micrograms and in patients above 10 tsh when you're starting treatment you would probably start with at least 50 micrograms in patients above 20 you may straight away go to 75 to 100 micrograms when you're starting treatment caveats firstly uh, you need to be careful in elderly you need to be careful in elderly or those who have any history of coronary artery disease where you will start with really low levels of thyroxine and if somebody has unstable angina for example you would start with even 12.5 microgram not even 25 otherwise in established stable cad you can easily start with 25 to 50 and build up so you could start with different doses typically the tendency is to start with lower dose and build up not to start with high dose and reduce there is no by and large except in new nates or in pregnancy two situations we need to correct hypothyroidism urgently except in those situations there is no urgency to correct hypothyroidism completely you can go step by step so start with a lower dose typically for subclinical 25 to 50 for 10 to 20 tsh 50 to 75 above 20 75 to 100 and then build it up over months so do your next tsh 4 to 6 weeks right don't do your next tsh in one week again i am excluding neonates and pregnancy but otherwise roughly 6 weeks is when we call back our patient so we start somebody let's say a patient has tsh of 12 so we start with 50 micrograms right so we call the patient after 6 weeks check the tsh again see if we have achieved our target and then up titrate the dose to maybe 62.5 or 75 or 100 as the case may be the full dose of thyroxine for someone whose gland is not functioning at all is roughly 1.5 to 1.6 microgram per kilogram of body weight so let's say it's a 100 kg person the full dose might be about 150 160 but 
But if it's a typical 70 kilogram person, 60 kilogram person, the full dose should be closer to 100 microgram. 1.5 to 1.6 micrograms per kilogram body weight is the full dose of thyroxine. Uh, so there is a common practice to treat dif- uh, patients with different dose regimens for, for example, weekday dose or weekend dose. So how to do that? Well, uh, the common practice in hypothyroidism is to give treat patients on a daily basis, which means you will give their medicine daily in the morning on an empty stomach with nothing to be taken for about 30 to 60 minutes after that. And that's important, right? That is critical. Now, patients make a lot of mistakes in this. They don't take it on an empty stomach. They think tea is okay to take tea or milk after the pill. No, nothing for 30 to 60 minutes after the pill. That's important on a daily basis, right? There are other people have used many variations. Some people have tried using weekly regimens. Now, weekly regimens were popular in the US many years ago, and they still are probably used in, 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 in for patients who forget their medicines. Or, or in the elderly who've got Alzheimer's or cognitive dysfunction or they live in nursing homes where the nurse goes and once a week and gives them all their pills together. And that concept has sort of gained ground in India also. I would limit it to those who are seriously non-compliant. Otherwise, I would say 99.99% of my patients would be on daily doses of thyroxine. Maybe I have one or two patients who, who, who really will not take a daily dose. And in that case, you can use once a week dose. Now, it's important why once a week can be used. It can be used because the half-life of thyroxine is seven days. Right? So if you, if you give all of the week's dose at one, in one go, you would still maintain blood levels for seven days. Right? The problem is that you will also get a rise of, of, of thyroid hormone level in between because you've given so much at, at one go. So, you know, it's not totally physiological. So one would prefer to give daily dose except in those who are seriously non-compliant. So as you have elaborated on the thyroid disorders in pregnancy, so what is the current treatment for thyroid disorders in pregnancy? So we're going to leave hyperthyroidism here. We haven't spoken much about that. That is less common. And definitely, it's, that is a specialist domain. Hypothyroidism pregnancy is very important. And as I already emphasized, you must treat all kinds of hypothyroidism in pregnancy, including subclinical hypothyroidism. So in pregnancy, even when planning pregnancy, it's good to have the TSH below 2.5. Some people say 3. You can, you can follow whatever you like. But it's good to have even pre-pregnancy TSHs when under control. During pregnancy, especially during the first trimester. During the first trimester, it's good especially to have TSH levels below 2.5. And, and later on, you can go to up to 3 or maybe 3.5. But, but first trimester is important. Why is that? Because in the first trimester, the fetus is dependent on the maternal thyroxine. And in that first trimester, the fetal brain development is dependent to some extent on maternal thyroxine. So, if you overtreat in the first trimester, you will not go wrong. So if you have a little low TSH, it doesn't matter in the first trimester. But a high TSH, even a TSH of 4 or 5, and not ex- is not really acceptable in, in first trimester. You need to bring it down with treatment so that we can ensure that adequate T4 reaches the fetal circulation. So again, to repeat, treat all types of hypothyroidism in pregnancy. In the first trimester especially, try and keep the TSH below 2.5 or below 3 if you prefer that. But keep it in that range. And a slightly low TSH in the first trimester does not harm the baby or the mother. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having this session with us. We are very happy that you spoke about thyroid disorders and many other things that doctors (laughs) are looking forward to. Thank you so much for being with us. These interviews are featured exclusively for the doctors of DocPlex's community. To receive updates about such upcoming events and interviews, please subscribe us on YouTube, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. Happy Doc Plexing!